In section 5.4, we'll be focusing on the quadrilateral flow chart and basic definitions. This section is extremely important along with section 5.5 since it will require you to memorize many properties of these shapes. You can use this flow chart to help you as well as creating flashcards to help you memorize the various properties of the shapes. Feel free to revisit this video, make flashcards, and read the sections in your books in order to get a clear understanding. Let's start off with the quadrilateral. We know that a quadrilateral is a four-sided polygon. All of the shapes on this page are quadrilaterals. And we have three different groups that we can focus on here with quadrilaterals. We have a parallelogram, we have a kite, and we have a trapezoid. Let's start with the parallelogram. In a parallelogram, we know both pairs of opposite sides are going to be parallel. So let's write that out, and let's also include tick marks on our diagrams. Following that, we know that both pairs of opposite sides of a parallelogram always have to be congruent. So let's put tick marks to represent that. Now let's discuss the angles. We know that if we have a parallelogram, the opposite angles are always going to be congruent. Let's put tick marks on our diagram there. And finally, let's talk about this idea. We know that the opposite angles are always congruent, but the consecutive angles in a parallelogram always have to be supplementary or add up to 180 degrees. Now, consecutive angles are angles that are next to each other or in a row. So, I'm going to give you an example of one pair of consecutive angles here when I highlight these in red. So, these two angles are next to each other. If you were to follow the diagram around clockwise or counterclockwise, we'd get some other consecutive angles. These two angles here would have to be consecutive, so they'd add up to 180 degrees. And those two angles there are supplementary as well. Now let's take a look at the kite. If we were to draw in this vertical segment, what we would create here is a line of symmetry, which means if we were to fold the kite along that dotted line, it would match up perfectly on both sides. So that's called our line of symmetry, which then means that these two yellow segments would be congruent. And also, we know that these two green segments would be congruent. We have a specific name for the sides of the kite, those two yellow segments that are congruent, as well as the green ones. We know that in a kite, we know that we have two consecutive disjoint sides that are congruent, or two disjoint consecutive sides that are congruent. That would be representing the yellow sides and the green sides. Those are congruent. In a trapezoid, it's a basic shape, and we know that exactly one pair of opposite sides must be parallel. We call those opposite sides the bases, opposite sides that are parallel. All right, let's move on to the rectangle. Notice that the rectangle has an arrow coming from the parallelogram that's pointing at it, which means that the rectangle holds all of the properties of a parallelogram. So, we can write here that we have the parallelogram properties. Instead of rewriting them all out, you just can look back up at those properties that we wrote down for parallelogram to recognize them. Let's go ahead and add tick marks to represent them. So, we know that just like the parallelogram, in a rectangle we have both pairs of opposite sides parallel. We have both pairs of opposite sides congruent. And now, we know that the opposite angles must be congruent as well as the consecutive angles supplementary. But, I'm sure we know this already, in a rectangle we have right angles. So, if we have at least one right angle in our parallelogram, we could call it a rectangle. Because, if one angle, right angle is there, we know that the opposite angles are congruent, so that angle must be a right angle as well. And since the consecutive angles are supplementary, these two angles have to add up to 180 degrees, as well as those two. So, all four angles of a rectangle are right angles. Now let's talk about the rhombus. The rhombus has two different arrows pointing to it. We have one from the parallelogram and from the kite, which means that the rhombus holds properties of both the parallelogram and the kite. Now, we'll talk about the kite properties more tomorrow in section 5.5, but now let's just review the parallelogram properties. So, 
we know that the rhombus has those properties and also at least two consecutive sides of a rhombus are congruent. So let's go ahead and fill in all of our tick marks. So just like the parallelogram, a rhombus has both pairs of opposite sides parallel. We also know that our opposite angles are going to be congruent. So let's put tick marks to show that. And now let's talk about this idea of at least two consecutive sides congruent. Well, we know in a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. But if at least one pair of consecutive sides are congruent and then the opposite sides are congruent, that means that all four sides of this rhombus are congruent. Now let's discuss the isosceles trapezoid. Now the isosceles trapezoid is going to hold all of the properties of the trapezoid above since it has an arrow from the trapezoid being drawn to it. So that means we know that at least one pair of opposite sides are parallel. That's our basis. Those are our bases. And then we also know that the non-parallel sides of the isosceles trapezoid are congruent. And we call those the legs. Think isosceles trapezoid. Okay, so the legs of an isosceles trapezoid are congruent, the non-parallel sides. And the angles that I just highlighted in red there, we call those the upper base angles. You'll learn more about those tomorrow in section 5.5. And then the angles that I highlighted in purple, those are called the lower base angles. Moving on to our final shape, which is the square. The square is the most detailed and complex shape that we have on here. If you notice, the square has arrows coming from both the rectangle and the rhombus. And if you even look further up, okay, it comes from the parallelogram and kite, which the rectangle and rhombus stem from those shapes. So the square is going to hold properties of all of those shapes, the parallelogram, the kite, the rhombus, and the rectangle. So let's go ahead and fill in our tick marks. We know that both pairs of opposite sides of the square must be parallel. And just like the rhombus, all four sides of the square are going to be congruent. And just like the rectangle, all four angles in the square must be right angles. So essentially what we can say here is that the square is considered both a rectangle and a rhombus. You probably have never thought about that before, but a square is a rectangle and a square is a rhombus. That's how you could be thinking about this flow chart. Wherever the arrows are coming from, that's what that shape is. So if we started our square, we have arrows coming from the rhombus and the rectangle, which means the square is a rectangle and a square is a rhombus. Now if we even look further back, okay, if we start with our rhombus, a rhombus is a kite and a rhombus is a parallelogram. And a rectangle is a parallelogram. And if we even want to go further, a square we know is both a rectangle and rhombus, but if we follow the arrows back up, a square is a kite and a square is a parallelogram.